All right, have, uh, hello everybody and welcome to our seminar. Today I'm glad to introduce you Selçuk Yerci. And Selçuk is, uh, has received his ESNMS degrees from Physics Department at Metro and PhD from uh, Electrical Engineering in Boston University. So after completing his PhD, he worked as a postdoctoral doctoral associate at MIT on the team film crystalline silicon solar cells. Dr. Yerci is currently an assistant professor in micro and nanotechnology program in our department at Middle University at, at METU. And Dr. Yaji continues his research activities in his research group under uh, GUNAM. And his uh, recent research is mainly focused on high efficiency uh, solar cell, including material growth, device simulation, and device fabrication <coughs> aspects. Dr. Yaji is also uh, a recipient of the Chiba uh, 2017. 2017. So I leave the stage to Sajik. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Hey everyone. Um, so as you see the title, so I will be talking on the most light management in photovoltaics. So these are typical structures that I'll be discussing. Um, and what we want is we would like to uh, get the light into the material and be absorbed there and generate electrons and balls and collect those. So that's why. Uh, we'll be discussing what are the advantages of those structures and how to design them and what should be the principle of them. So first I will start with the, uh, my research topic, a little more detail. Uh, so APP, Advanced Photonics and Photovoltaics, the, the name of the team. And we are working on uh, basically both in the photonics and photovoltaic side. And these are more experimental sites on both sides and the, related with the material fabrication. There are also some experimental and simulation in between the domains and this is the spectrum reshaping that I'll discuss today and optical and electrical simulations and light trapping and these are the topics which are right in between of these two topics and I'll be discussing uh, those ones and the team uh, right now at ADP is like two postdocs, four PhD, five MS students and eight uh, BS students and uh, so it's, we, we had mostly group is right now uh, electrical engineering, uh, chemistry, and physics uh, students, and we uh, time to time have mechanical engineering. Right now, there is one also chemical uh, engineering student in the team, and also we have uh, some sort of international aspect of the team. So there are Iranians and Indonesian, uh, we Swiss just graduated, and Egyptian as well in the group. So there is right now Constantin will continue with us for the next year, and the, um, there is one from Albania who is sitting here as well, and. These three students will be uh, soon a mess and there will be more uh, undergraduates. So as you see, there's kind of uh, the shape is uh, satisfied, but it's getting much, much larger. And the work that I'll be discussing uh, today will be done by these three guys and also this look at the brother. So these four uh, made the, the work that I'm going to present today. So I'll start with a, a little bit of cl cliche slides. If you have seen this before from me, I uh, apologize for that, but uh, for those who haven't seen it, so on the right are the finite uh, resources, and those are the ones that are supposed to finish at some point on the Earth. And these are like coal, uranium, petroleum, and natural gas. And the one on the, uh, the left are the um, not that finite, at least in the lifetime of human being. And this is per year how much electricity that we can generate. The, these areas here, uh, the size of these spheres in the right side, if these are the total amount. On the left side, these are the amount that we can produce per year. So as you see, this, this is, these two are the world energy use per, uh, in 2010 and 2050 projection. And this yellow sphere over here is the energy that we receive per year from the sun. And if you make a quick uh, comparison with this one and the others, you see that actually the, uh, the main supplier of the, the world energy is supposed to be the sun as the all other animals and the plants are using this. And, but there was one thing that uh, the human being is typically worried about is the price. Like what is the price that we get from the, when we get the electricity from these resources? So nobody would like to pay more money for the electricity just because it's coming from sun. And this actually very interesting chart is shows from 1949 to 2012 the price of electricity of the main things that we that are available. Things like natural gas and coal and crude oil and liquid natural gas. 
And you see some fluctuations in the time of like energy storage in the world, uh, in a shortage. But this red one is the price of electricity that we generate by the solar, right? And you see that before 2009, the price was actually quite high, but all of a sudden there's a big decrease in the solar. And if you zoom into this one in 2012, now it's comparable with these guys, which is natural uh, gas here, and it just became comparable. And in the same years, as you see, 2010 is over here. And this is where Germany started all this PV tariff. And there is a sudden increase in the solar global installed PV capacity, right? And there is a huge price reduction in the last decade uh, in the photovoltaic. And there are things like this one. Mexico it has one auction just penalized uh, in April this year, 1.3 gigawatts. And this has 20.57 megawatt hour uh, the dollar. Uh, this is enormously low prices, and this, wh what happens right now is that there's an auction and all sort of energy uh, suppliers can actually give price. So like I will use natural gas and I will use the coal and so on and so forth, and solar starts to win those auctions. So it's not only solar is winning the solar auctions, but it starts to win the global auctions. And the guy is Martin Green, is the biggest guy in the photovoltaic. He says like there's one idea, there's one cent per kilowatt hour. Is it ever possible to achieve this? And there was one uh, big competition in 2020. There is the uh, US uh, program, it's called the Sunshot. So there is Moonshot, which is who is going to reach the moon first. And it was a big uh, claim of US. Uh, and when they're competing with Russia in 1960s, Right now, it's a Sasha who will reach the, two, the, the one cent per kilowatt hour uh, for the electricity that's generated from solar, right? That's big targets here, and there are also uh, very big uh, changes in the game. And one of the things is if you compare the renewables in between them, and nuclear is this one in 1965 and over to 2016, and here is the wind, is how it's dual up, and it's, it's quite fast as well, and this one is solar right now. As you see, there is like 2012 and on the number of installed or the, the power that we can generate from the solar electricity is much, much higher or it's getting higher than the other renewable sources. And this is uh, between 2010 and 2012 and global average annual net capacity addition. So these are not the installed ones. These are the things which we are installing newly in the global, right? And if you look at this one, coal is the most uh, <coughs> added capacity in the world. And there's gas is pretty high as well. But there is the sun and the wind and other sources are also competitive. But if you look from the perspective of 2017 and 2040, so, and what is expected to be is the solar will be the number one added capacity of the electricity production method. Right? So that actually shows us clearly that the solar and also wind is coming the second will be the one that's actually being installed uh, from now on. And actually what's coming next is uh, from push to pull, so creating a PV uh, that offer the world and the uh, world cannot refuse. So what is uh, shown here is there are some frogs in water and water is start boiling. So this is uh, indicating the global warming. And it says that all this climate change, uh, the, the panels, all the like, the politics, they talk with each other, but they're inside this hot water and they don't really feel that it's, it's warming up, right? But what PV does is, it doesn't go right now into this business, but what it says is it gives you an offer that has much less carbon dioxide emission than any other technology except nuclear. And it actually coming into the, the play and reducing this global warming uh, problem. And th th it used to be something like this for the PV. So when people were saying like, okay, I would like to install PV to my house because there is no electricity here. And I don't have any other option. This is the cheapest in this case. But what is going to be right now is going to be like this. There are right now the white photovoltaic panels. Right? There are different colors that we can get. There are different shapes and especially we are working as well, different figures, maybe you have seen one of the star projects that we had this year. And right now it's going to be like different colors, different decorations and flexible panels. 
and for different needs and we, there are photovoltaic into play. So what I'm going to concentrate for the next is how does a solar cell work? I just would like to give some uh, overview on this one. And then what is coming next is the tandem devices and spectrum engineering or spectrum reshaping is what is right now hot topics in the field. And all of this, they require uh, light trapping. And I will be discussing the light trapping activities in my research group. And the first, how does a photovoltaic work? We work in that uh, principles. First, the, sun, the, the light comes from sun and it needs to be absorbed by the material. So we need to absorb the light. And the second one is there should be electrons and holes are generated. And the third one, we have to collect those carriers. So luckily, the second one, efficiency of second one is pretty high by nature. Right? We just need to worry about the transport of electrons to the outside, let's say in a microwave oven, or we need to worry about the absorption of light. Can we make the devices such that they are black and they absorb all the light coming on them? And this one shows the specular irradiance. This is the energy or the, or the power that's coming per meter squared uh, in the Earth, uh, which is the red one, and the yellow one is what's coming from the sun. Some of them are absorbed by the, uh, by the, um, the water molecules in the atmosphere, and these uh, red ones is what is reaching us. So if we say roughly it's, it is a shape like this, and what we need to do is we need to choose a material which is a band gap, right? It's one single material, and it is a band gap of something. Let's say it is a band gap of this one, right? And then once we choose this one, we need to plot something like this, uh, this uh, green curve here, because what happens is when the light comes onto it, the reflection and transmission results in loss efficiency. So if, you ref if the light is reflected or if it is transparent, then those are the photons that we cannot collect, and that means we are losing the efficiency. And if the band gap is large, if I push this guy towards this side, then transmission will increase. Those are the photons which don't have enough energy to be absorbed by this material. If I push it on the other side, what, is, what we call is the thermalizations. We generate electrons and holes, but they have too much energy. They lose this energy by scattering with each other, right? Then we still lose the energy. Then what is, it, what is actually the optimum is a band gap around 1.4. It's, it's typically said 1 to 1.6 is what is really that we can target. So this is what people have done in the last like four, 50 years. So the silicon, CIGS, carbon telluride, and CZTS, all these materials are very important because they have band gaps which are very suitable for this action. And once we generate this electron and holes, what we should do is we should collect those carriers. And the electrons, they're broken from the bonds with the photon energy, they, they need to circulate through the circuit and the power external units. And PN junction or every junction, they help the electrons to be further apart from the atom where it was removed. So we shine the light, it has an energy, it removes this electron. But this electron would like to go back to the atom because this is what nature dictates. But we need a mechanism which can be a PN junction or a junction. What it does is it applies an electric field and push this electron away from this atom and then hopefully collect it from the carriers. And there, there's one way to do it, uh, is the upconversion. So there's one way to go over this, is upconversion. So what we do in the upconversion is, this is the non-absorbed photons here. On the right side of this one are the non-absorbed photons because we choose a band gap which is equal to this one. And what you can do is you can use a material which is called the upconverting material. What it does is it gets two small energy photons and push electron from here to here and then from here to this one. And it goes back from, electron goes back from this exact state to the ground state and emits a photon which has a higher energy. So as soon as you have a solar cell, these photons are not absorbed because they don't have enough energy. They go to a layer and in this layer, two of them sum their energies and come back to the silicon. Now they are absorbed. So by doing this, we can actually make this region to be transferred in the photons in, in somewhere that, for example, the silicon uh, can absorb. So this is one way of going through. So this material here is excited by 9, 980 nanometer 
uh, photons and it's emitting with 532 nanometer photons. So this is one example of it that we are running a project to. And the second approach is the following, not using one material, but using two materials. So one of them, you, when you plot this green line, you plot it like this, the thermalization will be very small. The second one, you should plot it something like this, the thermalization will be small. So by putting two materials on top of each other, one of them utilizing the photons which are like blue and green, the other one utilizing the photons which are like red or infrared, you can actually boost the device efficiency quite a lot. And this is the second uh, idea, and the most important material is right now perovskite. Because the problem here is, tandem is really great. It's really the future, I'll show you a few slides on this one. It's really what people believe that this is where the nature, but the, the future. But the problem here, there was no cheap material which absorbed the high energy photons and give you enough potential out of it. So they were absorbing it, but they were also losing the potential of these electrons. So perovskite is the first cheap material which actually can do this action and was found in the year of 2009. Right now it's about nine years and it became like 22% efficient and it's in the first leak of the PV uh, industry. And this is the, uh, the commercial module efficiencies increase over a year and this is the most uh, important reason why the price is going down so quickly because the research is so active there are thousands of people working in the photovoltaic uh, area researchers, the companies and so on and so forth actually hundreds of thousands of people working on it and the efficiencies are going high in years uh, quite uh, steep and this is the, these are the thin film technologies which are relatively low efficiency but low cost technologies and silicon is over here, which is relatively high efficiency, high cost material. And this, there is one practical limit for silicon, which is about 28%. But 25 is, uh, is first, uh, is a practical limit for the module. 28% is a practical limit for the cells. And silicon is right now getting very close to this practical limit, right? So what is going to be next is, what is right now being pushed is, they're using silicon and TFM on top of each other. By doing this, what we should do is we should keep in mind that what people care, what we care, the people in this room, they care how much you pay for how much energy, right? So when you put these two together, the cost is increasing, but the outcome is also increasing, right? There is a balance uh, in this point, and the prediction says, uh, this is the technology roadmap uh, predictions. It says in 2020, there might be some tandem devices in the market. Right? This is right now, the, what is the, um, what's the plan? And there are a lot of big European Union projects and US projects and the companies in China and Korea and Japan right now working on. And this is one of the uh, perovskite solar cells that we made in our laboratory and it has a tunable band gap, so we can change this band gap, we can change the crystal structures, and this is, it shows the, 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 the distance between the atoms, and this shows what the band gap is, looks like. And we can, gen, we can make those materials, and the efficiencies, I'm not going to talk on that one, the efficiencies in my group or in Gunam, uh, for perovskite is about 18%, and for uh, silicon is about 19%. And if, in a top-notch uh, research, laboratory, which is like from Hofer, the perovskite is slightly above 20% and the silicon is about 25%. Right? So we are uh, pretty close to that one, but not uh, the higher than the, the highest efficiencies that, that are reported. So now I would like to switch on the light tripping and what is light tripping and what it does, uh, what, what's the relation with these buildings. So light tripping is the following. And then all these colors are coming from the sun, and there are some infrareds, which I cannot show by color here, and they're coming from the sun. And what we want is, if this light, if the material is not good enough to absorb this light, we need to make this photon to stay inside the material as long as possible, okay? And the second thing that we should do is, we should make this light not reflected from the surface. So we don't want reflection, we don't want transmission, right? We want all the light to be absorbed. So if you hear something like, hey, there is one guy who made a transparent solar cell, right? Which I'm sure you have seen from the news at some point. Then I say like, how is it possible, right? 
If, if it is transparent, that means it's transparent to I. That means it doesn't absorb the light, which is in the visible colors, right? Where the most of the photons are coming from. So by saying like I'm gonna make a transparent solar cell, you have to sacrifice 70% of the solar spectrum away. And the other 30% you can utilize it and get like five, six percent efficiencies, which are the theoretical, theoretical maximum. And the first thing we need to absorb it, and how we are gonna do it. There are four methods uh, that are commonly used. Number one is the geometrical optics, where the size of the structures on the surface are much, much smaller compared to the wave, uh, much, much larger compared to the wave. And the light is like a ray, it comes here, some of them goes into the silicon or solar cell, the other reflected, it goes into silicon, reflected again. The more it's reflected, the better for you. And this is what we call as a geometrical reflection. And this is right now the uh, state of the art random fibers. And this is what, when you buy a solar cell, this is how the surface will be. And the second one is the photonic structures, where the, wave, the size of structure size on the surface is in the order of the wavelength. And the wavelength is between 300 and 700 nanometers typically. And in this case, if it is periodic, we see well-defined diffraction lengths. If it is uh, not periodic, then we see some sort of diffraction-ish looking uh, the, straight, the, the light which is scattered into the medium. Right? And two examples of this are this inverted pyramids that we produce in our lab, and this random pyramids that also we uh, have in our lab available. And <coughs> these are relatively hard to fabricate, but if you can make it low cost, they can actually be the replacement of the current technology, and they're actually uh, being replaced, uh, they're replacing the current technology. And the third one, which is extremely efficient, is called the effective medium, where the structure on the surface are much, much smaller than the wavelength of the light. Then this is called the, the effective medium. This is like the frog that I show you. The light reached the surface, and then see a material which is like 99% air, 1% material. Right? It says like, okay, it's good, let's go in. And then the material is, is increasing, the refractive index is increasing. At the end, there is, the refractive index goes from 1 to 3.5 for silicon. But since this gradually changes, the light actually doesn't reflect much on the surface, but it's scattered into the material. And this uh, requires spirit preservation. So what does it mean is the surface array increases, the collection efficiency typically decreases on those uh, materials. I'll come to this as well. Last one is the plasmonics, where again the wavelength is much, much larger than the size of the material. The material here is the metals, and the electric field is concentrated on the regions around those metals. And the problem is they have the parasitic loss uh, by metal nanoparticles, especially Alpine Bank works on this one quite a lot in Yunnan. And I will be discussing these two in the materials which I will uh, give you as examples in the next slide. So first I'll start with thin film silicon solar cells with sub-micron size uh, surface texture. So these are in the order of wavelength. And silicon is right now dominating the industry. So 93% of the photovoltaic industry based on silicon materials. So solar cells fabricated from silicon, they dominate the industry. And silicon is reliable, potentially lower cost, uh, high, lightweight, and they are flexible but fragile. So silicon, if you make it thin field, you can get all these benefits together with the high conversion efficiency that's available today. But the problem is, silicon is an indirect, indirect band cap material that you may not know what it is. So there is the conduction band, there is valence band that we have seen from, uh, for example, e E212. And this conduction band and valence band supposed to be in the same momentum space. So what does it mean if the light comes and, and interact with an electron, this electron is supposed to go to the conduction band directly. But in reality, this doesn't happen for some materials. The light doesn't have enough momentum to push the electron from one S band to the conduction band. It has enough energy, but it doesn't have enough momentum in some cases. So in those materials, uh, the absorption and emission requires some heat transfer from the material. So it either needs to give heat or get heat from the material together with the light to satisfy the momentum conservation rule. As a result, silicon is a poor absorber, and this is the yellow is the M1.5, so this is the solar spectrum, and the uh, light blue is the absorption of 100 micron thick silicon, and this darker blue is the absorption of 10 micron silicon. So as you realize, 
silicon cannot absorb all this valence. So it's really not a good absorber for those valence. So what we do is uh, we make those structures which are much smaller than the state of the art, which is available. And it's the first time it's, it has been done that small. And this, uh, the, the yellow one here, it shows 150 micron thick planar silicon absorption. And this yellow, the continuous one, is the, one, the same thickness with the surface structure like this. So if you put this surface structure, which are pyramid shaped texture on the surface, randomly oriented and produced in a cheap way, uh, this 30 micron thick silicon, it can absorb on this much initially. You can push this curve up here. So by making a good light trapping structure, which is random pyramid in this case, you can actually make 30 micron thick silicon to absorb almost as good as 150 micron thick silicon. And we actually went through and make these devices, we peel them off from the thick silicon surfaces, we thin them down and then peel them off and roll around this um, the, like petri dish and so on and so forth. And these devices has 13.62% efficiency, the last one that we made. Uh, and that was actually pretty close to the value uh, that I did when I was back at MIT, that was 15.7% uh, efficiency with a more advanced, uh, more expensive techniques for use in this case. And the second structure that I'll show is the non-structured uh, light trapping by metal etching. etching. <coughs> and those structures, let me see, this is 500 micron here. They have sizes in the order of less than 100 nanometers. So they're very, very sharp needles on the surface. And those structures are made by some metal assisted etching. And this is the structure from the cross-sectional view. So this is 500. This one is about 100 nanometer here. And this hole here is about like 50 nanometer here. And so on and so forth. So we put the metal on this side. There is the PN junction somewhere here. And then the metal at the back side. This is how it looks like the device is out. This is only like 8 nanometer thick. It looks black to the eye. So when you look at it, it's literally look black to the eye. So that means all the light which is coming onto it is actually absorbed, which looks surprisingly great uh, when we first did it. And then we made device, device out of it, and the efficiency is 9.60. So it's 9.6. So it's 8 micron thick, extremely cheap uh, way of making it. It's flexible. So what, what else you can ask for? Uh, but then we did a bit look for it and then say like, let's do an analysis. And this is what we are doing quite a lot in our team. Uh, we do some optical and electrical simulations to understand the, what is really happening inside because there are too many things happens in, in once, right? When you collect the carriers, there is the light reflected, transmitted, absorbed, carrier generated, collected, and all these have their efficiency. We see an overall performance. And what we did is, this is the, how black it is. So when we measure the reflection, it's almost zero reflection, especially for the visible colors, which is, it sounds like great. But when we did the simulation for different colors, we see like, okay, the, the green or blue colors, they're absorbed at the surface. 600 nanometer can reach to the backside. 750 is absorbed great in the material. But all others, they go back and forth. So this more like uh, orange colors means more absorption, more yellowish colors means less absorption. But the, this, like these different shapes here, it actually says like the light goes back and forth in between, between these two. So this is what we call light trapping, which is great. But when we integrate the amount of light which is absorbed in silicon and which is absorbed inside these metals, what we realize that actually this blue line shows the light which is absorbed in silicon but this one shows the light which is absorbed in aluminum. So actually this design, it is great because it looks black, but it's, it looks black because aluminum absorbs a lot of light. Right? It's not the silicon. So if the aluminum absorbs it, there's no way that we can take it back from it. Because aluminum is, has a lot of free electrons, and those electrons, they scatter with each other, and we lose the efficiency very quickly. So then we, we, we look for the carrier loss, uh, carrier collection losses, there's something called external quantum efficiency, and we can actually separate the, the absorbed light in aluminum and the carrier collection efficiency. So by doing this analysis, now you know what to improve. And we say, all right, the number one loss is coming from this one, and how we can improve this. 
Uh, this shows the reason for the carrier collection losses, which I'm not going to go into detail. And what we say is, okay, let's change this design on the back side and make this planarizing the rear side. So rear side right now has the black, this textured surface. And the problem in the plasmonics or the textured surfaces, light can couple onto the metal, right, the, the, and free electrons in the metal, if they are more like vertical shapes. But if they are more planar with the perfect smoothness, then there is no way that light actually can couple on these devices because it doesn't have the momentum component for it. So why say light? Okay, let's assume that we make the backside planarized, which actually increases the cost of fabrication. But let's say we made it. What should it be look like? It should be something like this. The blue curve should go from here to this red curve, which is great. That's say like any low refracting next layer between the silicon and reflection, reflector. So silic light goes from silicon to aluminum, right? And if you put something in between, and let's say put a silicon dioxide, light should go from silicon to silicon dioxide, then silicon to the metal. More interface means less light will interact with metal. And if you do so, then it should go from this red curve here to this purple one. And it also replace the back side to a less glossy material, which is from aluminum to the silver, then it should go to somewhere here. Right? With this way, we can actually go from 29.65 mA per centimeter squared to something like 35.90. So that actually means 3-4% efficiency increase in a solar cell. And the last thing, I will skip the last one, uh, so that I will just show this one. Uh, the last topic that I would like to show is the cadmium telluride. And this is actually a problem that came to, uh, to us from a uh, British uh, university, Swansea University. And they're working on cadmium telluride solar cells. <coughs> and the problem is this tellurium is very scarce in the earth crust. So it's one of the least available material in the earth crust. So if you start to use this a lot, it will be more expensive than gold, right? So then what will happen, what, what we should do is we should find a way to reduce the amount of cadmium telluride. And the idea here is the following. Let's say we have zinc oxide nanowires, and around these nanowires we put this uh, cadmium telluride material. And this actually should make the light stay in the material for a longer time, the light is coming from, will scatter all the directions and will interact with this material for a longer time. And will it work? That, that was the question. And we did the material fabrication. This shows the steps of it. And this shows the SCM images. So these are zinc oxide nanorods. And then they are coated with cadmium sulfide. And then they are coated with cadmium telluride. We made the device out of this material. We got 4.2% efficiency which is the highest uh, for this technology right now. Uh, and these are the nanowires shown here. The, this, uh, the blue one shows zinc, and this purple one shows the sulfur, and tellurium is over here. There's gold contact on the top, and we got this efficiency. But this 4.2 is extremely small compared to what is the state of the art. So it's the nano concept is the highest efficiency, but for the planar concept, it's not even close to a good efficiency. And then we did understand this one by using, again, optical and electrical simulations. And we, we constructed the same structure in the optical domain, which is FTTD in this case. And then uh, we analyzed where the light is absorbed. And for different colors, you can see that where the light is absorbed by eye. So this, again, the red color means it's absorbed more. So for the long wavelength, it's absorbed in cadmium telluride, as it should be. But for shorter wavelengths, it's actually mostly absorbed in cadmium sulfide, which we don't want. Right? So this actually shows that this nanostructure concept is not that great for most of the most of the cases. Later on, we find a way that's in the published paper right now uh, that if you replace this cadmium sulfide with a less absorbing material, there can be again a record efficiency available. But there is one more thing that we always need to keep, keep in mind: we generate you can increase the optical light trapping, which if you just search for light trapping and go into the literature, you will find like approximately 80% or 90% of the papers, they only consider the light trapping. They say like, if you do this, you will get more light absorbed. If you do that, there will be more light absorbed. And most of those structures are, from the electrical point of view, they're stupid ideas, right? most of them. And here it shows one example of this one. So you have this structure, 
and this colors here it shows the band banding. And if it is one, if it is more like uh, yellowish color, this is where the depletion region. This is where we have the electric field. And in this case, the hole and electrons, the electrons generated here, there is carbon sulfide around it, so the electron needs to travel very short distance. So it's easy to collect this electron. The material doesn't need to be good because we have this nullifier structure. But the problem is, now this hole needs to go a very long di distance. And while it's going this long distance, it doesn't see the depletion region at all. It's so far from the depletion region, it doesn't have enough diffusion length, it cannot reach the depletion region. So we cannot collect this cable. And if you're in this region, or if you're in that region, where the hole can easily be collected because it's inside the pit side of material, pit type material, then you are in a good shape. But otherwise, this will not work. So this is one uh, carrier collection efficient simulation that we have done uh, for this study. I'm not going to go into this one. Uh, this is for perovskite, and which is mostly planar, but uh, for planar structure, you don't need to do the texturing. Uh, what, what you need to do is you need to find a way to trap the light inside the material that you would like to make the, the absorption. So in this case, I want to make an absorption inside the perovskite. So I need to choose the thicknesses in a way that every time, in every interface, when these two waves, they interfere with each other. Supposing they, they should make a constructive interference towards the person. And this case is shown here. Uh, so if the second wave is like this, so the first wave is reflected, the second white one is reflected from the back side, and they are right now in parallel to each other in the air. That means the, all the light is reflected, or the most part of it is reflected. What we want, we want the constructive wave to be into the material. And by doing this, uh, this engineering, actually you can get the efficiency increase for perovskite. And we have shown that the, the thickest perovskite is not always the better one. So you don't worry about this one, just look at this black one. And this black one shows a thickness of 300 nanometer is actually better than a thickness of 350 because you can generate more current for this one. So more light absorption uh, for, the, for a thicker material. So with this one, I would like to conclude my talk and show you uh, two more slides on the UNOP. And uh, the first thing that I would like to give as a message, PV makes an offer to the world that cannot be refused. So this is starting now in 2017, 2016, that's the range of breaking point. The actions start to be more in the favor of photovoltaic. And the, especially Mexico, Chile is the one who made it available, Dubai made it available, uh, even in Dubai, the price of electricity generated from the electricity can be cheaper than the price of electricity that you can get from petrol because they don't want it to be too, too cheap because they are selling with a high price. So they, it's actually very cheap for them, but they don't sell it that cheap uh, to themselves as well. And the second one is the spectrum reshaping. Tandem and light shaping are the three most promising strategies to push forward. So. We know from right now the learning curve or the curve itself, how it goes. We know that it will get even cheaper. But what should be, there are a lot of things being tried. It's a huge community. So they don't, don't really mix this with the other communities. The PV community is enormous. The size of the community, the number of professors, the number of students is enormous. And the number of published papers is, is really hard to follow. It's, it's for, for our team. The number of published papers in perovskite, like five, four students, five students. If you say I would like to make an efficiency chart over years, it will take months of doing it. Right? It's not, not enormously high uh, published papers right now. The number of published papers. the efficiencies of 15 percent can be achieved using the much thinner silicon compared to state of art thick silicon. So this is one of the research that, that we are working on uh, right now. We can make in, in the start project. Uh, we, we have done. We have demonstrated this. We can make solar cells with pictures on them. It's, it's one solar cell, you can see different colors of pictures, and this is based on interference. There are like 10 nanometers, 5 nanometers difference between one position to the other. There's only one thickness variation on the surface, but we have a picture, right? And if we, this can be done, and we are working on it, it can be, uh, we will move it to the company. Uh, but this is something that we're working, and we also try thinking to make it thin and flexible that will actually be uh, more um, interesting. 
And we can't wait to I think this can be significantly reduced by utilizing uh, extremely thin absorbing structures uh, over zinc oxide nanowires. And this is something that we are working in collaboration with Swans University. And chemical collection efficiency needs to be taken into account. So we are lucky that we are in the more electrical engineering uh, team uh, than most other competitors. And our electrical simulations are actually quite uh, accurate in most cases. And when we do a light turbine structure, when we suggest something, we suggest not from only optical perspective, but also from the electrical perspective. So I'd like to thank you for, the, uh, for listening. And if I have time, I just want to show a few slides on the uh, on GUNA and acknowledge uh, the Swansea University partners as well. Uh, so the, the research has been done under uh, the GUNA facilities. And for those who don't know it, uh, this is the GUNA management board. So there is uh, myself from, in this case, representing electrical engineering and with, uh, the chemistry, the physics and mechanical engineering professors in the team. And there are some administrative staff, uh, which are half of them are from university, the other half uh, are actually provided by our fundings. Uh, and Professor Turan from physics uh, department is the, the director of it. And there are professors from physics, chemistry, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, material science, and even uh, the, um, the architecture department uh, right now in it. And there are about 100 postgraduate students. So this is, again, a good number for 30. Uh, but in, when you compare it from Hofer Institute, which is about 1,200 uh, employees working in the Institute on the photovoltaics. So this is it's good size for, for, uh, for, for us. It's one of the biggest centers in Turkey. It's biggest right now in Metu after uh, MEMS being uh, like uh, free or, or, or spun out uh, from us. And uh, right now there are two new buildings are making, being uh, uh, built. And one-fourth of this building, that you have probably seen this before, and one-fourth of this in the, uh, the ground floor, the first and second floor, will be belong to um, the, the Guna. And then there's one more uh, place, which is uh, the, what we call is the pilot line. Uh, and this is more like a company, not a It's somewhere in between the university scale to the company scale. And all the equipments are things like that you find in the companies, in the real, like big companies in China, for example, but they're in a smaller size. So if you make this one, maybe like 50 times more in size, that will be a gigawatt company, right? So this is a small facility from that, from when you compare with that company, it was pretty large. Uh, you see some, some humans uh, over here. So it's pretty large, it is more like a, a it looks like a, uh, a pile of light uh, in this perspective. And I think this is, uh, this is the picture from inside. Uh, so these are the ones to, to take you to the surface and then you make the PN junction, you coat the top surface, the anti-reflective coating surfaces and phosphate the surfaces and put the metal contacts on top of it by using some uh, ch relatively cheap metals, commercial metals. So with this I would like to finish my talk. Thank you for it.